please, please stand by. I'm trying to streamline it. No, you're good. All right. It is 617. I will call the meeting to order. I will call the roll. Mayor Ryan Sorensen is present. Older person Trey Mitchell. Here. Older person Roberta Flicky Pineski. Older person Grazi Perella. Here. City Plan Commission member Jerry Jones. Here. Sarah Ruiz Harrison. Here. Nicholas Dussault. Here. All right. Uh, for those in attendance, and if you're able to stand, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, next is a motion to approve the minutes from our previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. There's been a motion by Roberta, second by Trey. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, please state aye. 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 Any opposition? All right. Minutes are approved. Next, everyone's favorite item, RO number 12223 by the City Administrator submitting the capital improvements request for the years 2023 through 2027. Um, Administrator Wolf, do you want to do any opening statements? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I basically want to thank all of the department heads. This year is um, basically my second, second round of capital improvements. We've been making a lot of uh, changes year over year. We're looking to be doing a lot more strategic planning. The department heads have done a great job trying to work within our budget. It's been a tight budget. As you recall last year, we kind of tightened things up because of the spending that we had been uh, doing the years before that. But the team did a great job. We are gonna have some great improvements in the next couple of years with the uh, implementation, as we all know, the EAM, which is the um, Equipment Asset Management Module, That'll actually be a lot, that'll allow us next year to look at roads with actual data. And in the year after that, we'll be able to look at our facilities with actual data. So it's, it's great stuff. We are also trying to implement increases uh, and contingencies. Again, these are things that were not done. And we're also looking to add projects for the future. We tend to only go out five years. We're looking to go out uh, further, like 10 years, so that, so that the Capital, Capital Improvements Council as, uh, and committee and the council actually have a better view of what projects are needed in the future so that we can take that into consideration for, for the borrowing and fees that we're gonna need. So thank you, everybody. All right. I wrote the list from memory in order, so if I get it right, Carrie will appreciate me. Oh, perfect. Todd gave me the list, even better. Um, first off, um, is a presentation from Uptown Social. Uh, the director, Emily Rendella Rajo, will go first. Thank you, Mayor Sorensen. Um, 
I'm just realizing this is my first time going through capital improvements and I don't even have an example from any of my colleagues to follow. Uh, so please bear with me and um, be patient as I talk about our project. Uh, this is a very, this is a pretty simple thing. As, as you're hopefully aware, um, currently in 2022, we are in phase one renovations of the former Save-A-Lot building to be our new um, Uptown Social Center for our programming. And that is anticipated to be completed in November that we can take occupancy and move in. Um, what we are proposing for 2023 is we would like to do phase two of construction, which would be the gymnasium build out and exercise room. Um, this is a net zero project because the Friends of Uptown Social, our 501c3, has agreed to fund this fully. Um, so Caitlin might have to help me explain a little bit the um, logistics of how the finances would work. But essentially, we'll be getting help from DPW in working through the contract and um, having the work done and then the Friends of Uptown Social will completely reimburse the city for any charges and any of the project costs. Questions? Questions from commission members? All right. Okay. We've set the bar high. Net zero. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next uh, is the library, Garrett. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the library just has one project today, and it's a, it's a roofing project. So um, back in 2016, uh, we started working with the Department of Public Works with Mike, um, and we had a company called Tremco who does their roof consulting come through, and um, we've had several repairs on the library roof since then, um, which we paid for and uh, through our uh, reserve fund that we've got. So the library gets to keep some of its money left over at the end of each operating budget. Um, because we are funded through the county as well. We've got some different funding mechanisms than most of the general funds. Um, however, Tremco has said that uh, in the next few years, we really need to replace the roof altogether. So um, they're estimating at 2025 that we'll need, need to have the entire roof replaced at 378,000. Um, Administrator Hofflin had started us on the path to saving um, partially like a 50% cost. He was his Hope and, and Administrator Wolf is continuing with that thought. So the library does have about half of that cost saved for um, when that time comes, we should have about half of it. So we're looking at um, 184,000 um, through the city for funding for that project. Um, I think that's about it on it. It's pretty straightforward. So questions? Questions for the library? Sherry? Go ahead. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Question, I, reading in the description, you know, I see words like delay, piecemeal, catastrophic, and, and we're looking three years down the line. Do we have that kind of time or is this just a ballpark estimate from the um, contractor? They thought that we're in, in good shape for a couple more years, but they do want us to completely replace it. So we have been piecemealing it, so to speak, since 2016. We've had a couple of different repairs on it, um, but he, um, in what he, did in 2021 in the summer, he thought it would go through the 2025 season was his estimate. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Garrett, just, just to kind of, to help with the, for the committee, if, if people were to look actually out, out the window to the north, you can see the actual lighter green patches on the mm -hmm. Mead Public Library roof. And correct me if I'm wrong, it was what, three years ago that you actually had them come in and do the, the patchwork as we call it. Yes. And then they actually, that was to extend it to allow us to hit the 2025. Originally, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we actually thought that we had m even more time. We did. But then after you and I reviewed the actual documentation, it brought, it came back to 2025 was the actual time that it has to be done. Correct, we had them in the first time, I believe in 2016, and then we had them back through in either 18 or 19, and they had moved up the timeline on us at that point. At first it was going to be a, a good 10 years, and now there's, they're, they're shortening that down, so. Right, and we did make a, an adjustment to the amount of money that the library is putting into that fund to be able to make the 50% the mark that's been estimated. Yep. Um, Alder Flicky Pineski, then Alder Perella. You were on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, was I understanding that the whole roof costs 300 plus plus and you have 50% of that whole roof costs accrued from years past up until this point? Um, not yet. Not, uh, we're working, we're close to it, I believe. We're, so we're super close to that money, to 50%. And, and keep in mind, this is a, a 2021 estimate as well. And one of the things the, the Tremco warned us is that over time, this could be volatile and could change and could go, probably will go up, let's face it. Okay. So. Okay. So what we see in the capital improvements budget is the remaining 50%? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're looking at, uh, what is it, 184? 137. Page number 137. Yeah, page 137. Um, half of that 368 would be 184. Okay. And and the accrued dollars were budgeted dollars that were not spent previously from the city budget that you could accrue. For the most part, it's operating funds that are left over at the end of the year. So if, say we don't have uh, filled positions, things like that, uh, we, we get to keep that money back by state statute. And so that's uh, the majority of that fund comes from, I mean, 70% of our budget's uh, personnel. So you, you have to think most of that money came from that. There's some other things that we've, um, Administrator Wolf had some money put into that this year that was, uh, let's see, found some from, insurance savings, there's things, so there's some miscellaneous things as well, but the bulk of that money is left over at the end of the year and it just goes into a reserve fund. So, and then we had allotted that towards the, uh, this roof project. So, this, I, I'm trying to get back around. So, the dollars that are left over at the end of the year, you could cho choose to use them for example, to hire more personnel if you wanted to do that? Or is there is it encumbered is what I'm asking? Um, it, well, you wouldn't be able to use a reserve for um, personnel the next year because it'll run out eventually, goes and that would be ongoing. But, I mean, you could use it for materials or other repairs within the building, something like that. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Alder Perla? Actually, um, the questions were answered. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me. Um, additional comments for the library. Sarah? Do I have to press this you're good. one? You're right, okay. you're good. Yeah. So is that typical that you, you um, other departments roll over their funds from previous years, so when they need things done, they also do the same thing as the library? Um, it's unique. I, I don't know that there's anything written right now. This has been an ongoing dialogue with Administrator Wolf at this point between he and the, essentially the, uh, myself and the library board on how much. And so it's it's not... It's not in an MOU or anything, and so it's uh, it's just been ongoing. It depends on the administrator and the relationship with the library board at that time, quite honestly. So in the past, I mean, we've struggled with, um, years ago with, uh, like we had an HVAC that was getting pretty old, and that one took quite a few years to get. Uh, lately, we've had better luck in this process, I guess. Got it. So. And that was, we knew that we had an issue back in 2016, correct, you said? Um, that estimate. was the first year that uh, Mike Wilmus got Tremco to come over, at least to work with us at the library. So, and then we identified several issues at that point. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I guess just to add a little bit of uh, hopefully some clarity, the library as a separate entity that does get state funding, county funding, and city funding, uh, the city in, in working with the library has basically stated that um, year over year, the city, um, well, not the city, the library actually puts, um, at the time, it was $20,000 a year aside for projects, for maintenance, repairs, things like that. And knowing that the roof project was coming, that, that money would also go towards the roof. So the city pay, typically pays half, and the library typically um, comes up with the other half with the funding that they have available. With the library and the roof, at the $20,000 marker, we were going to miss the target because of the updated um, bid that 
or quote that uh, Garrett had received. So um, I believe it was last year or this year, we actually bumped it up to 27 to help make that number of the 50%. This is money that's literally in its own pocket for the roof, roof repair and then um, the city would be borrowing, as you can see on page 137, the city would be borrowing 50% and the library uh, puts forward 50%. So this is not money that's available year over year. It's only the $27,000 um, towards uh, repairs for the library. Thank you. Okay. All right, other questions for the library? All right. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Garrett. All right, next is our friends in parking and transit, Derek. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass around a supplemental memo on a couple of projects um, that are not listed in the CIP, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, as far as the next five years, um, we have two projects, one in parking in 2024 and one in transit in 2026. Uh, for the parking project in 24, it would be the uh, replacement reconstruct of the riverfront parking lots uh, along uh, the riverfront down uh, for riverfront drive. Uh, this would only be the east lots. There's uh, east and west lots. West lots are by the George Warner uh, High School. Uh, the east lots are what you would know by Parker Johns, uh, Duke of Devon, uh, that area there. Um, and that's slotted at uh, $600,000 at this point. Um, and, and it really is a placeholder at this point until we uh, get a further confirmation on uh, being able to do, these pro or do this project. The uh, transit project in 2026 would be the replacement of six uh, fixed route buses. Um, these would be replacing our 2010 uh, buses at this point. So by 26, they'd be 16 years old uh, or thereabouts. So um, that would be uh, for that transit project. Um, we, uh, thanks to this committee and uh, other city staff, um, we are taking delivery of 10 brand new buses starting this week. Um, to update our fleet uh, dramatically. So over the last three years, we went from 75% past useful life uh, to a matter of 100% within useful life. Uh, so that was quite a, uh, quite a feat. So I wanna say thank you to the commission and uh, those on Transit Commission for making that possible. Uh, there's a couple of projects that were removed from 2023 um, and beyond. The first one, uh, many of you have approved or saw uh, over the last couple of weeks go to council for approval. I apologize, I was unable to make it to finance and personnel. Um, I had a, a staff meeting back at Shoreline Metro. Uh, so. Uh, but I am providing some additional information here. Uh, this item, because it's purchased through the uh, parking fund, parking utility fund, it is not purchased using general uh, uh, obligation debt or any borrowing. So this vehicle will actually be purchased just using uh, our fund balance. Um, so I've put a little bit more information together for that. Uh, the other project would be uh, to replace uh, our paratransit buses using CARES Act dollars. Again, uh, CARES Act dollars, because we did not furlough employees over the course of the last two years during the pandemic, would allow us to uh, replace uh, capital at 100% rather than the traditional 80% through federal grants. Um, the basis for taking advantage of this is that we have to exhaust our CARES Act funds. Um, and the other thing, uh, the other part of it is, is that we have an aging fleet there as well. Uh, so we would like to uh, move forward with um, allocating uh, money through CARES Act uh, for the purchase of, it's not six, it's actually five uh, paratransit buses. Um, and we would procure those uh, starting this year already um, and have them hopefully by the end of this year and into early 2023. That would also greatly increase uh, the age and reliability of our uh, fleet on our paratransit side or our demand response side. So there is more details there about um, uh, this project. If we do go forward and, and as we recommend going forward with CARES Act dollars, this would save the city an estimated uh, 150,000 in borrowing uh, for these vehicles if we were to go uh, forego CARES Act dollars and uh, take advantage of traditional federal funding, uh, the 80-20% uh, federal funding. So I guess I'll leave it there and if anybody has questions. 
questions for Derek? Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, we just voted on 10 new buses. Is that accurate? You did not Common vote. Council. You did not vote on them. That was that was voted on uh, last early last year. They were already purchased. We're taking delivery of them here in the next couple of weeks. So we had ten buses replaced last year, but they're not here yet. They're coming. They're the funding. They were approved not last here. year. Yes, they were approved last year. The purchase order was issued, and we are taking delivery now. It's about twelve to fourteen months. A process to uh, by the time you issue a purchase order to when they're delivered okay so in this particular budget you're anticipating six more in the next five-year capital plan yes the uh, I'm recommending six more in 2026 to replace our 2010 model buses so at that point um, they would be 16 years of age at that point. And useful life is, is technically 12 years. Okay. Um, we've let some of our current buses go uh, 18, 19, and 20 years. And uh, once they come off the road, I'll be happy to show you pictures. Not before. <laughs> okay. And, and the CARES Act is for the, um, is the, the CARES Act money goes for the new, the six new ones? This, yeah, this is this is not on your CIP. The memo stuff is not on your CIP because it's using um, basically self-sustaining funds or 100% funding. Okay. So we would we would go and purchase six additional buses through our um, for our paratransit program, our small buses. Uh, we would purchase six for that pro for that service and get rid of our 2010 to 2016 model buses in that service. So we have we have 21 large buses and 10 small buses Thank you. and one trolley. No partridge in a pear tree. 10, one. Thank you. That helped. Jerry. Thank you, uh, Derek. What is a passer rating? It, I have no context on it. It says these lots uh, for the parking utility have a passer rating or PASER rating of four. What what's the relationship there? Where's Dave? Is he sitting in the corner over there? <laughs> can you, you you can probably describe that better than I can. Okay. It's 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 a it's a a, a pavement rating system. It's on a ten scale. Ten okay. being fantastic, brand new. One being pretty much gravel. Mm -hmm. So a four, it's beyond. It's it's in the poor, getting down to the fair to poor category. Typically, poor is one to three. Fair four, average right around you know six seven. So. It's it's due, and, and the the point is, if you get let it get below four and get to a three level, then it becomes much more expensive because it's much more of a reconstruct versus a resurfacing. Great, thank you. Additional thanks, Dave. Additional comments for Derek. All right, thank you. Thanks, Derek. All right, next is information technology. Thank you, Mayor. So for information technology in 2023, we are looking for $35,000 to assist us in uh, retiring our legacy AS400 system. Uh, we're still running um, a number of applications on that system. In 2023, that will be in our fourth year of our plan. It's a five-year plan. So then again in 2024, we'll be looking for some uh, funds to help us retire the software. In 2025, <clears throat> we will start our data center refresh. We did a refresh in 2018, uh, 2019, so that'll be starting to hit that five, six year age and we'll be looking to replace some of that equipment as well as we will be looking to potentially add a second internet connection to the uh, sink ring. The sink ring is shared by the city of Sheboygan, the county of Sheboygan, and the school system. And then we'll not ask for any money until 2027 at this point, and that'll be once again for the uh, data center refresh uh, for the wastewater treatment facility. Any questions on the IT side? Alder Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, just a couple. Would you just mind walking us through what 
some of the equipment that's going to be replaced in the data center refresh will be. Is it what? I'm pardon. Uh, what kinds of equipment are, um, is being replaced? Yeah, the, the first the first we'll take a look at is the servers and see what new technology is available for those. And um, we'll, we'll be evaluating that too. Um, we continue to move more and more stuff to the cloud. So that'll be kind of a balancing act. Um, the other pieces of equipment that we'll be looking at will be our SANs or, or network storage devices. They'll be getting older and as those age, we typically start to see more failures in that storage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One other, if you yep. would not mind indulging me. Uh, is it accurate to say with the uh, second internet connection to the sync ring that right now there's a single, single point of failure for the city, the county, and the school district if? I'm sorry, repeat the question one more time. The redundant internet right. connection. Right now without that, do we have a single point of failure for our internet connection for all three of those organizations? Um, out of the three entities that share the sync uh, network, the city is probably in the best shape. Um, we do have a secondary connection, although it be one tenth the speed of what our primary connection is. Um, if we were to lose that connection that goes out to WISNet, which is our primary connection, we would switch over and still have email capabilities and we'd have limited outbound capabilities, but any access trying to come into the city would be inhibited. Probably the biggest issue we would have would be for the fire station and the police department. They, their MDCs or mobile data computers that are in their squads and their trucks would not be able to get back to the resources they would need. I'm looking forward to the completion of that project then. Thank you. We are, yes. <laughs> Additional questions for IT? All right, thank you. Oh. Uh, Alder Flicky Penance. <clears throat> sure, thank you very much. Um, when when I look at an IT budget that goes for five years and I see two hundred and ninety thousand dollars, I worry that we aren't keeping up. And I guess I wonder if we need more infrastructure instead of less. That's a very good question. We, we spent a fair amount of uh, capital when we redid City Hall, and we basically rebuilt the City Hall data center from scratch, as well as the wastewater treatment uh, plant data center from scratch. Um, part, you know, part of that cost is some of the equipment we, we were anticipating uh, getting seven to 10 years out of, especially like the switches and the core switches. Um, we also have the capability on many of those switches to go from um, a, a one gigabyte connection to a 10 gigabyte connection over the fiber. So we've got room to grow that bandwidth if needed. And um, th the modules we use to go from one gig to 10 gig are, aren't that expensive. They're, you know, it would still be probably 10 or $15,000, but it's not gonna be above 25. Okay, so you're content with less than a half a percent of, of the budget over the next, of the capital improvements budget over the next five years? At, at this point, yes. Okay. It, it, I, if, if we're gonna probably look at additional capital funding, it would probably not be for the infrastructure, it would probably be on the software side, additional software applications um, that we're, we're identifying. But at this point, we also realize that we have a few applications that we've already purchased that we haven't fully imp implemented and leveraged yet. So we're gonna focus our attention on what we have right now, get that up and functioning. So that, that's our plan. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Additional comments for IT? Okay, moving on to our television station, WSCS. In 2023, we will be looking for a new broadcast server. Um, that will be seven years old, and that's kind of the heart of where our, our broadcast and production starts from. Um, that will also give us uh, some capabilities for closed captioning. 
So, and then in 2025, we'll be looking at a TriCaster replacement. Um, once again, that'll probably be seven or eight years old, and that's just a refresh of that equipment that we look at. And then we're also potentially looking at the purchase of another broadcast or a new broadcast truck in 2026. Uh, the broadcast truck will be 21 years old. So I think we're beating Derek on the bus age a little bit, but. Questions regarding cable? Alder Perilla. Would you please um, explain again, what is that the, how will we, how will the server improve the broadcasting? Um, what is that the replacement, the server replacement will actually accomplish? It'll be newer technology, um, more reliable. It'll have additional features. Um, once again, the other big portion of that is the closed captioning. Mm -hmm. That's something we've been looking at for a few years and um, it, it, that continues to come down in price as the technology improves for uh, artificial intelligence or AI to help, um, I guess, translate the speech into text for closed caption. Thank you. Other questions for Cable? All right. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Thanks, Eric. All right. Next is the police department. Chief? Good evening. Um, so throughout our five-year program, the primary thing that we're going to be purchasing is vehicles. Um, we have our vehicles on a replacement plan. Mark squads get replaced every four years. Um, in the past, they had been replaced every three years. What we want to do is try to replace them before they hit 100,000 miles um, in four years now because that's when the warranty is going to run out. So that's when it's really going to start costing us um, the most money. So these are the vehicles that are used 24 hours a day, every day. Um, our unmarked vehicles then are on a 10-year replacement schedule. Um, they're used less often, so we're able to get uh, more longer time out of them. And then you'll see in the plan, occasionally we'll move them around if we don't need to replace one right away or we have some other project um, that's going on. So in 2023, we're asking to replace four mark squads and one patrol um, wagon. So the patrol wagon is 21 years old and that's why it needs to get replaced. It's just at that point where it's more expensive to keep it rather than to update it. Um, and use it. Um, so that's a really um, kind of a low use vehicle, but something that, that when you need it, you, you want to have it. And so we're using that when we're making mass arrests or when we have somebody that has some kind of disability or medical condition that um, we're not putting them in an ambulance and we can't fight with them to get them in the back of the squad. It's just easier to have that bigger vehicle to be able to place them in and make sure that they're more comfortable in, in transporting them. So that's in 2023 and 24. Again, four marked vehicles and one are, uh, unmarked vehicle. And then there's um, $71,000 for uh, facility maintenance. So the police department, we moved in at the end of 2008. So it's getting at that point where we need some carpet replaced, we need to do painting, um, all of those kinds of things. So that's funds for that. Um, in 2025, we're replacing one marked vehicle um, and then four other unmarked vehicles. Um, you'll see um, there's a, a difference in price there. The, the unmarked vehicle, um, that's more expensive would be a detective car. So it's going to get all of the same kind of equipment that our mark squads get where the other three um, are things like for court services, for officers when they're going out of town to training um, and those types of things. So what we're trying to do is to essentially get a vehicle that gets them from point one to, to point two. Um, court services, so when they're driving from the police department to the DA's office or, or the court um, they're going to be using one of those vehicles. 
And then the other thing that we have in 2025 is funds to replace our computers and our squads. So at that point, they'll be five years old. So they'll be just about um, at end of life there. Um, so we're replacing the computers in the squads with the current technology, whatever that might be. And then also if um, there's changes in the squads, um, we'll have to purchase new mounts for the computers and things like that. So there's funds for that. Um, in 2026, again, we're asking for five Mark squads and one unmarked squad. The unmarked squad that we're asking, or the vehicle that we're asking for there is one of the small trucks that the CSOs use um, for writing citations and picking up abandoned bicycles and doing those kinds of things. And then in 2027, again, four unmarked vehicles, um, four marked vehicles, one unmarked vehicle, and the other CSO truck. And then there's a um, million dollars in there that's placed marked for improvements to our impound area. Questions? Questions for the police department? Alder Licky Bonesky. Thank you. Um, I am recalling that council entered into a contract for um, not not police squad cars, but for leasing city vehicles. Was the police department not counted in that particular program? Um, we submitted the data to them. I don't believe that what you're going to find is that um, it's going to save the money that that DPW does because we're going to have higher mileage use out of it than DPW does with the vehicles that they're using. All of the equipment um, upfitting that's done and the costs that they're going to charge the city to do that. We do all of that in-house right now. Um, so there's just a number of factors that um, makes it the, the contract different. I don't believe that you're going to find um, that it's going to work out like it did for DPW. Can, can I? No. Um, so when you say a marked vehicle and an unmarked vehicle, an unmarked vehicle is outfitted just like a marked vehicle? Similar, so not exactly the same, but but similar. So what we're talking is two different vehicles in, in that the marked vehicles are driven by the police officers that wear uniforms um, and they're used three shifts every day. An unmarked car is gonna be used by detectives they work one shift primarily, so that car's not gonna put on the miles and get the, the wear and tear that the other vehicles are. Okay, thank you. Additional questions for the police department? All right, thanks, Chief. Thanks. Next is the fire department. Good evening. Thank you. I want to say everybody looks nice today, so thank you. <laughs> Sounds like uh, he's asking for hopefully, something. Uh, yeah. Hopefully this will work. So, um, I got a little PowerPoint real quick to, we'll go through if, um, if I can get it to work. You have to drag it over. Okay. <laughs> it should be. All right, Scott, let's see. <laughs> yeah, it's not dragging either. All right, well, that'll save you the PowerPoint, although it's a very nice one, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> so, Everything's in the book, and uh, we'll just go quick on 2023. Uh, we're asking for $2 million for a Station 3 remodel study, or excuse me, at land acquisition and engineering phase. Our station is currently 52 years old. Um, it's in heavy, heavy need of remodel. It is not quite up to standard. It's not ADA compliant. Uh, the facilities don't allow for the easy use of a female firefighter, so 
Uh, there's a lot of things. Our generator is also fa uh, failing. So this, this uh, you'll see this phase. It's, this is phase one. There's gonna be two more phases throughout the uh, next couple years, so. Also, our ambulance, uh, we're requesting a purchase of a new ambulance. All our ambulances were purchased at the same time, uh, basically when we took over the ambulance service back in 2008. Uh, so this ambulance is gonna be 15 years old and we are using a portion of our ambulance fund for it and then uh, the rest from tax levy, so it'll uh, offset the cost. We're requesting uh, station four, which is uh, gonna be 33 years old uh, next year to have the window and door replacement. And uh, if I could show you the PowerPoint, there's uh, some leaking, some mold starting to build up in some areas. It's not quite uh, healthy and safe, so we need to get those remodeled and fixed. Uh, something that's new for our capital items now is our, we moved our, we were replacing our turnout gear, 10 sets of gear every year. That was out of a capital outlay. Uh, Director Krieger moved it over to the capital items, so that's also in there, but that'll be used with tax levy funding. And that is it for 2023. In 2024, um, we are requesting again, phase two of the station remodel. So that would be uh, $4 million, uh, again, if it was approved. Uh, that would be phase two. Uh, we're also replacing our ambulance, which is gonna be 16 years old. We currently have uh, four ambulances. You'll see those come up the next years as well. So this, again, would be offset by the ambulance fund. So basically it's paying for itself. Cardiac man monitors, which we use when we have a cardiac arrest. Uh, we use them every day for blood pressures as well, so they're used on every single uh, ambulance calls, uh, so that they're gonna be 10 years old. Uh, we do have five of those, we request replacing all of them, and so you have the same technology, you don't have different monitors on different ambulances that are uh, have different uh, type of uh, software in it. And then I have also listed uh, our station three generator, uh, SCBA filling station, which is for our air packs, and our turnout gear rack, that was just listed there in case station three's phase one and two were not approved. I have to replace it, the generator is not, uh, they don't make parts for it, it's leaking oil, it's our emergency backup, so it operates everything in that fire station. So if we don't get the remodel, we need to get that replaced. So um, that's in there as a contingency. Then we have our turnout gear as well, as I mentioned before. Moving on to 2025, uh, the phase three of the station remodel build uh, would be in there for six billion. And then we have uh, an ambulance, which at that time will be 17 years old. Again, funded all through the ambulance fund and we have our turnout gear. In 2026, we have our uh, Quint engine. Uh, what that is is a combination ladder truck and an engine, so it has a ladder on top of it uh, as well, a large one that can extend about 100 feet. And uh, this one uh, would be replacing one of our reserve engines, which is 23 years old, or will be in 2026. We also have an ambulance as well, so again, uh, that would be 18 years old, funded completely by the ambulance fund. And then we move on to some remodel work. We're trying to anticipate and forecast ahead. So this would be a station four remodel, which uh, the station at that time would be 36 years old. Uh, we also have a gear rack for station one, uh, then a station two remodel the same year, and that station will be 47 years old. Uh, and then you will see there um, what we refer to as station alerting system, and that is to uh, that's a way of our uh, personnel to be notified of calls. It uh, will speed up the response, hopefully getting them out the door a little quicker as well throughout the, all the stations, so. And then our turnout gear. And then finally in 2027, uh, our training facility, so currently our training tower at that time will be over 61 years old. We can uh, really not use it as it is today. Um, however, we do use it for flowing water and stuff. Uh, so that uh, that is uh, part of the, uh, hopefully the station three land acquisition remodel, but we also need that training facility. Uh, 21 year old uh, station five roof replacement and update. 
Uh, that would be uh, the roof right now is original to the station. Uh, then we're also requesting some furniture replacement in uh, for station one. Uh, that would be over 10 years old. And then slowly we're starting to replace our command vehicles, which is uh, would be about 13 years old in 2027. So again, my apologies that the PowerPoint wasn't working, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. All right, uh, Alder Perella. Yes, thank you. Um, can you can you please? Uh, so let's start from the phase one of the of the station. I mean the the big one. So uh, you say land acquisition is that. So we would start from the land. It wouldn't be anywhere that already the city owns. Is that right? Sure. Uh, Administrator Wolf wants to answer that question, so I'll I'll defer to him. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, what I'll do is I'll, ex I'll I'll explain a little bit of the the, the process of what's going on. Originally, with uh, Station Three, the uh, uh, capital improvements plan was to spend upwards of a, a million dollars, if you recall. Uh, I believe it was last year we actually approved a portion of that. The problem that you have when I came in, it, it's not that I came in, it's the fact that when I sat down with the chief and said, hey, what are we looking at? We have a 50 plus year old building and the million dollars wasn't going to correct and fix or address the root issue of the problem. So we have a 50 plus year old building that was built and it did not um, take into consideration firefighters that are male, female, or transgender. We also did not um, build it on a facility property that actually has the ability for future growth. So as an, a perfect example is right out our window here is station one. Station one dates back 100 years where it actually had uh, a buggy um, a, and a horse that actually pulled the pumper back in the day. We cannot put large equipment into the, into the old facilities that we have. All of the facilities are landlocked and they're not built for uh, future developments, meaning uh, changes in our, in our employee structure. Um, also the changes as station three as an example, which is our, our headquarters, Actually, they actually had to redesign it, remodel it years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, making rooms for the firefighters to actually sleep in. It wasn't uh, that long ago that the, the rooms that the firefighters slept in were just large rooms with a, uh, you know, a half a dozen bunks or whatever in there where everybody kind of slept in the same room, like a sleepover. So what we're doing is we're, we're actually doing a, um, a project to look at how should the uh, station three be looked at for future growth? So if we're going to invest money into the facility, do we have enough land presently to actually build and expand and, and um, allow the station to be remodeled into, you know, to give us another 50 years? Or are we gonna have to look at a new facility altogether? So it has been determined at this point that a new facility is what's needed because of the construction and engineering of the existing facility. The actual center of the building is where they, they have the tower for, for the hoses. Correct. And all of the building floor plan is structured off of that pivot point. So they cannot m just move walls around and change the configuration. Also, the land is not large enough for additional uh, bays for, for additional equipment that's needed as the city continues um, to, to be needed and grow uh, for, for its uh, facility. So we're also looking at not just the location, but we're also looking at the size, and we're also trying to put money into the budget so that the council and the uh, capital improvements committee understands that these are proposed exp expenses that we will be needing into the future. This is something that as an example, uh, those of us that have been on the, on the council, council and committee for a long time, when we actually talked about City Hall as an example, it kept getting moved down year over year over year, and it went from a $2 million project to a $3 million project to a $4 million project. We have the same problem going on with um, our Station 3, and we really need to be looking at all of them, and we are in the process of doing the engineering 
and design work as well as the site location. And that's why we're uh, putting this, these expenses forward is to step it through as a multi-year project so that we can build ultimately a new facility for the growth of the city. Thank you. Chief? All right, Good Alder Flicky-Paneski. <laughs> It's nice that your uh, PowerPoint <laughs> came up, Chief. Um, uh, when you talk about replacement of a vehicle, an ambulance, a, a truck, um, you talk about a reserve or the standby vehicle or truck. So when you get something that's new, do you take the newest of the two you have now and put the newest one in reserve? So typically we, we have two uh, reserve engines. Right now we only have one. I mean, as it was mentioned with the buses, the supply chain issue, we've had two vehicles on order uh, um, and they're still not here yet. Uh, and we purchased them and ordered them last year. But yet we would have two reserve engines. So when you purchase, when we get this new one, the first one that we ordered, that one will be put front line. So first to respond, and then the oldest of all our fleet will kind of move to that reserve. So you, it, it's in the best condition, but it's still the oldest. You, you don't want it running front line because it's, it's getting past, past its life. Typically a, a front line engine is used front line for about 10 years and then switched to reserve status for about five years. It's not always that way. Sometimes they're stretched and sometimes conditions based on wear and tear, it might be even less. However, that's typically, we, we try to stretch them out as, as long as we can. So, so when we see a budget, we aren't necessarily adding numbers of vehicles to the fleet. Yeah, in this case, we are not adding with the exception of what we did for the ambulance. That was the only one. We are adding one extra ambulance to get us to five. Our call volume is there, the need is there. So we would have hopefully in a few, in a, in either next year or a couple years, whenever the ambulance gets here and we're in service, we'll be able to put four frontline ambulances and now have that one fifth as a reserve. Currently we have three frontline ambulances and, and one is reserve. But we're using that reserve quite often now so uh, we need that fr that fourth frontline ambulance. The call volume warrants it. Right. So thank, thank you. <laughs> you bet. Additional comments for the fire department, Jerry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, question for you on the cardiac monitors, station three generator, and station alerting system. Those to me seem uh, like critical items, um, and I hate to use the phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, we're pushing those to 2024. What kind of sense of urgency do we have on the need to replace those? To be honest, I don't want to be the guy in the ambulance without a cardiac monitor. So, so uh, the cardi cardiac monitors that we currently have are in good condition. They're they're just they're gonna be at that time within in 2024 to basically replace. Um, we have one that uh, we're using as that we re, uh, refurbed, refurbished it to get it onto that fifth ambulance because it needs one. However, you never wanna replace any of them without replacing all because of the technology changes. We, we've been working with our manufacturer. They're maintained very well. That's why 10 years is about the good lifespan, eight to 10 years. Uh, so we are right at that mark. So this is more of an anticipatory thing. Correct, okay. correct. Right. Um, question for you, uh, Todd, on the building of uh, Station 3, with 2023, we're looking at land acquisition engineering. When, when would we estimate we'd start having some final numbers so that we know we're kind of in the ballpark on what that should look like? We're, we're actually working with different groups right now that, on land acquisition to see what's available. We're also, uh, Director Beeble and myself, we're working on re-reviewing re the actual uh, areas, uh, the, uh, I don't know what to call it, David, um, the actual zone for each fire station to see if we move it, you know, a mile, are we still hitting everybody and getting the, the times? We're also considering if we move it, let's say north, east, uh, do we still need maybe one of the other fire stations because of the, because of the zone and the actual um, surrounding areas? So again, we're looking at a lot of different pieces 
We're also trying to make sure that wherever we do put it, that it's on main routes and that it, there's enough land for future development, meaning the uh, training tower and the uh, EOC um, training center, if I'm saying that correctly. But we want to make sure that we have growth for the future of the of the fire station. Yeah, you hit on my point exactly. Response time and coverage areas. Correct. Is what I was Thank you. Additional comments for the fire department. Alder Perella. About the training facility, so that would be a separate project, obviously. And so, tell us more about that. What is the idea behind that? So. Currently, we have a training tower located at Station 3. It, like I said, at that time, it'll be over 61 years old. Uh, we can't even train in it. Uh, we can't use it for pulling hose line into the tower. We can flow water from the exterior in. It's just not safe any longer. Um, so we need a, a training facility, much like where we can smoke it up and drag hose through it and put it into the building and, and flow water. So that's what a training facility is. The one that we're looking at, and hopefully, depending on what the phases work out and the land acquisition in the Station 3 build, we'd like to have a combined training facility. As uh, Administrator Wolf mentioned, we, need, we are in need of an emergency operations center which is what an EOC is, and that would also help us obtain the, the size, the area of the EOC, uh, whether it's attached to the fire station or at a separate location in the same area. Yeah. So that's what a training facility would be. We would use it every day. Currently, we don't have, we can go to uh, LTC. Uh, unfortunately, because of the distance, I can't take a duty crew to go do it. So, I, you know, I would have to pay overtime to have crews go there. Uh, we would have to shut down a station for an uh, extended uh, period of time in order to facilitate the use of that. So it's, and plus we'd have to pay. So it's just not economical for us. Um, we just don't have anything in our area to work with. We are working closely with our neighbors, our three adjoining uh, districts, Town of Sheboygan, Kohler, and Town of Wilson. So we would like to use them and, and train with them more often in, in a centrally located area. So those are all things that that training facility could, could warrant and hosting classes as well. Mayor, may I? Yes. Um, so would this project do have a life on its own? Let's say that the first project of Station 3, I'm just um, hypothesizing sure. here, uh, is not approved. Then would that project, would that still make sense to, to have that project only for the training facility? Uh, absolutely. We, we don't have, currently we just right. do not have a facility for that. We, we can't have a class, uh, our training classroom at Station 3 can seat 25, uh, it, it's tight. Uh, we can't host classes uh, regional or statewide. Um, so yes, a training facility is needed. We need to, we just don't have the number of fires and this is a good thing uh, for everybody else, but for us in training purposes, it's not. We just don't have the fires anymore. So our, our we're a young department and they don't get the experience that they need. Uh, I can uh, pull a hose line into this room without having any smoke in there, you just, it's not the same thing. It's, it is not. So uh, we wanna be as close to realism as we can. So having a training tower that has the ability to allow us to smoke it up and ventilate, flow water, use our, all our training and techniques that we would use on a live fire ground, that, that helps. So um, yeah, it, it is a, a a needed item in this city. Uh, we're also talking to the police department and Department of Public Works to see if we can make a call, uh, combined training facility for all three departments, which I think, again, would help everyone. Thank you. Follow up, Grazia? If I can. Yeah. Um, you said that Station 3, and I have seen it, so I know that as a fact, cannot accommodate uh, all genders, right? Correct. Right. Um, can the other stations accommodate all genders? One can, uh, not adequately. Uh, all the rest, uh, the other four, including Station 3, are not quite made 
for that. We're working on it. You will see a plan develop. I'm working with Administrator Wolf and Director Beeble uh, and, and my assistant chiefs to come up with a plan to get our remodels. That's why you see the remodels in here as they are. Um, Station five right now can um, facilitate that. However, it doesn't have an ambulance out there and the call volume for ambulances aren't the same. So right now our female firefighter is it within, she's on the ambulance, so it's within the one station one, two, and three. She's assigned to station two. So we're working towards it. Um, so, so do you envision that that will be happening if those remodeling projects get implemented for the other stations? Then that problem at least will be some somewhat solved. Correct, meaning. You remodel the other two, I believe. There are two more remo two or three more remodels here, right? Yeah, we're as we right. get them on there. Yep, on the docket, yes. it should resolve that issue. Okay. Correct. Very good. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you, Administrator Wolf. Did you have additional comments? I just I just wanted to kind of add a, um, add some history. The training tower has been talked about for <laughs> God five plus years as an example. And with the strategic planning of, of the headquarters, Station 3, the reason, another reason why the um, relocation and rebuild and recon or basically construction of a new facility is, is on the table is because of the fact that we would have a training center and the training tower and the new facility with expanded uh, bays for, for additional growth all at the same facility and it would also give us enough room to actually have training for DPW for like trenches and other, other trainings that we presently can't do and we'd have to go to uh, another facility or like LTC to actually uh, perform that type of work. Another piece that I did wanna point out is the, as an example, and hopefully Chris doesn't get mad at me, but the PD can do training in old buildings that have been abandoned and, and that because they can go in and blow the doors off and cut holes in with visibility. When it comes to the fire department, there's so many pieces, even if we're gonna burn a building down, they actually have to go in, prep the building for safety reasons because they don't wanna go into a lit building, meaning lit as, as far as they can see, every time there's a fire, they can't see. So you wanna go into a facility like a training tower that's smoked because you're not going into a stairwell that's lit and, and, and visible. So there's a huge difference between what, the, what a typical department can do and what the fire department needs as far as training capabilities. They need to have those, that ability to flood it, that ability to smoke it so that it's real life experiences. Thank you. Other comments for the fire department? All right, good, I have a few. Sure. Um, so I know it's been a, been a few years, but I'm gonna say the word fire study. Um, for those that were around five years ago, and Chief, I think that this was completed right before you, you, Correct. you came on. I guess I'm just curious in terms of, of what that report said in terms of station positioning, number of stations, locations, opportunities for growth and expansion, where does that big puzzle piece fit into our plan moving forward? So excellent question. Uh, so the study you're, you're referring to is the Fitch study. Yep. Um, so actually, the Fitch study really said two things. We could leave it as is and, and we would be fine. Um, or if we were to go down or move a station, our stations are almost located in an ideal location, almost. Um, station three can go a block uh, don't quote me if it's east or west, I can't remember. Um, and as well as station two can go a little to the west. Otherwise, where they're located for the, the size of our city, our districts, it's, I, it, it is, they're all built well. And that was gonna be in a good my, location. My next question too is, are we thinking the same area for station three or another part of the city, but in generally what you're saying. So, so that is uh, what Administrator Wolf was referring to as we're looking at with working with uh, Director Beeble and the maps and seeing where our response districts and the time responses, whether moving it 
let's say eight blocks west or eight blocks east or you know would be ideal um, currently as the Fitch study shows that area that we're in right now station three is good it has a lot of large uh, arteries where we can go through to get to you know 43 or the rest of the city uh, currently station three houses our only uh, ladder truck so uh, it, it, it we are looking at that uh, I don't want to say that it's perfect right now because yep. we want to make sure that we're doing it, especially with expansion or potential expansion, we want to make sure we're right. You know, when I, I look at, okay, so next part. So first of all, sure. thank you. Next yeah. next kind of set of questions. You know, I look at, it's, you know, $1,250,000, you know, just for planning and studies, you know, and I'm just like, oof, I'm not really ever a big fan of, studies when it doesn't necessarily result in it, but this is a, a very big project. This is a, you know, several decade year old project. Um, you know, and again, are, are we gonna be looking at different opportunities for grants or other opportunities for funding? I didn't know, and, you know, definitely leaning on your expertise and professionalism, but does FEMA or are there any different other organizations that kind of help fund expansive public safety type projects like this that we could explore or start poking around on? There are, we have looked uh, and tried to keep our eye open. Uh, it's hit or miss on the timing. Uh, you, you don't wanna put the cart before the horse. So we need the approval, the land to move forward and then hit those grants and, and allocations hard. Unfortunately, they're very difficult to come by. Uh, so we will do what we can to try to make sure uh, we get our, the applications out there when when the grant period opens, but it's difficult just with timing yeah. uh, without having a, a location or a direct path that we're going. So I, I will do my due diligence to make sure we can uh, offset the cost if possible. Um, but unfortunately, I don't I don't have an answer for you right now, Mayor. Thanks, Chief. Mm -hmm. Alder flicky -Pineski. Thank you. Um, of the five stations right now, which is the busiest station? Uh, station one actually is. Right across the street. Correct. Where does station three rank in? Second. It's second. Second business. yeah. Okay. Um, currently, as you know, it's it's our headquarters, so it's kind of, I refer to it as centrally located, although station one would be more ideal. I just, we can't hold a function here where I bring all five stations together. There's just no room, right. uh, it, it's impossible. Uh, so we do a lot of that at station three when we need to. Uh, so all, all the stations currently, it's tough to, to hold that because there's no parking for the rigs, our personnel or outside individuals. Um, so, yeah. So when you, again, land acquisition and all of the processes that go into studying where it might be and how it might work, you would take into account call volumes when you redraw lines oh. or do? A absolutely, the, the main, the, the primary goal is not to decrease service that, that we provide now. So again, um, that's why we're looking at those response districts, the response times to make sure that our stations are located at, or the station three potential uh, where, where we're trying to look would be perfect for it. Uh, we don't want to decrease service. So that's the goal. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, last call, fire department. All right, thanks chief. Thank you for your time. All right, last but certainly not least, uh, Department of Public Works. Now marks are halfway through it, Mark. I got some chuckles. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Oh, sorry. I brought paper just in case uh, some displays in case the PowerPoint doesn't work. We, we appreciate visual aids. I think there was, I was poking up here and I think I was supposed to push the button. But. Uh, <laughs> it's just, yeah. we'll blame it on Eric. Yeah.
That's the wrong one. I, I'm, I'm going to, Scott, I'll, I'll have it if this works. That's a, an old one. That's uh, not the correct one. That's the new pedestrian bridge. That's the pedestrian bridge. Okay, I have to drag this over. That's a new bridge. There we are. <laughs> It on my screen. All right. Well, good evening. I know it's been uh, a lot of information uh, going through, but um, bear with us. Public Works, we have quite a bit to present this evening. And I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to mainly, mainly focus on is 2023. And I'm going to follow the spreadsheet that's in front of your booklet. So we're going to start with city buildings. And uh, I also want to introduce our DPW team. We have Don Sokolowski, our business manager, instrumental in helping us put together the capital improvements package as we is presented this evening. Mike Wilmus, superintendent of facilities and traffic. He's, uh, he's going to be part of this presentation in terms of, of the buildings. But, but first of all, I just want to talk about, you know, public works. You know, we imagine, we design, we build. A little brief introduction of, of public works. Where several divisions, as you're going to see this evening, kind of talk about our current state of our infrastructure and some of our issues that we're facing as a city, and then our project proposals. And I usually just start with a simple definition of what public works is, and it's those physical structures, facilities that are developed and acquired by public agencies to house government functions, provide water, power, waste, disposal, transportation, and other services. So when you, when you think of the city of Sheboygan, I like to use the analogy of we're, we're, we're just like any other business, except our business is almost 16 square miles in size. So think of it as two miles wide, and eight miles long. We have 200 miles of streets, 36 different parks. We have 209 miles of sanitary sewers, another 185 of storm sewers. Every day we're treating about 12 and a half million gallons of raw sewage, 42 signalized intersections. Street lights, we have 4,500. We have 19,000, excuse me, nine, uh, 19 bridges, which has over 168,000 square feet of, of deck. So just a, a, a tremendous amount of numbers of assets that we have as a community that need to be maintained on a daily basis, as well as with the capital improvements program for the future. Our, our, our purpose here is to leave Sheboygan better for the future than we were inherited when we had it. So our job is to continue to progress and move our community forward and make those critical investments. So overall, our infrastructure is in fairly good condition, average in most areas. We're a community that's over 150 years old. So as the city agents, so does our infrastructure. And this is not unique to Sheboygan, this is throughout our country. As I mentioned, we're about average. According to the Na uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, our nation's infrastructure is around a C minus. So how, where do we get here? So after World War II, the city really expanded. A lot of development, new housing. The focus was on building new, building new roads, building new sewers, water, parks, planting trees. Rapid expansion to, to maintain housing and, and, and allow the city to grow. But where we are today now, we're at a point where a lot of that infrastructure is aging and it needs to be replaced or fixed. 
So we're gonna start with our buildings as we're gonna follow along with our capital improvements program. And one of the big things that is an initiative is our ADA transition plan. A couple of years back, we worked with our insurance agents uh, uh, company, Civmic, and worked with their consultant to develop a, a citywide ADA transition plan, basically trying to look at all of our facilities, buildings, as well as park facilities or any public facilities where there's public access, and look at how we need to upgrade or become compliant with the parameters of the ADA uh, Handicap Accessibility Plan. So in some cases, these projects will uh, require some significant planning or capital, and some elements are just maintenance items. So, so some examples are bleacher replacements, automatic door openers in some cases, door uh, clear maneuvering or clear openings, elevators, playground replacement. This can uh, include actually requirements actually to get to the playground itself. Ramp upgrades, replacement or install. Any shower uh, needs to be redesigned or upgraded. Stairwells, handrails, toilet rooms, all of the above are some of the, the features that were included in this study. The study was comprehensive. The examples here are just some just simple, simple little things that everyday normal people such as us accessible that really don't really think twice of. But uh, restrooms without, without uh, grab bars, sinks without a lower sink for a handicapped person or accessible person, automatic door openers to get into buildings. These are just some examples that are in the plan. The ADA plan totaled roughly between two and a half to three million dollars just in these types of fixes throughout the city for all of our buildings. So what we've done with our plan is we've incrementally have allocated $250,000 and we alternate the years. We alternate $250,000 towards buildings for ADA improvements and then the next year in the, in the capital improvements plan, we're gonna put $250,000 for our parks facilities. This is a multi-year plan, but these, this is just kind of a, a, a I guess a, a large overview for, for understanding. Our next, next project that is facilities or buildings related is, is the Harbor Center Marina reconstruction. The, the marina is over 25, uh, roughly 27 years old this year. It is, uh, it's showing its age, especially at least the, the, the dock systems. We've made substantial improvements to the actual marina facility in terms of its, the, the, the building itself. It's been recited, roofed. Uh, it has new windows. There's been several upgrades on the inside. But the actual marina proper facilities where the boats moor, those are original. Uh, and every year we've had ice issues and ice damage. And over the years, it's gotten expensive. From its beginning of its life, we've probably spent over $1.8 million on ice damage to docks over the years, for over the last 27 years. I don't think that's sustainable especially knowing that we're gonna to have to invest in new docks for the marina in this, in this plan. So what we need to do is we need to address this issue of the ice and the wave action that is causing much of this damage. So one of the first things we're going to do is engage a professional consulting engineer. We've had some past studies of wave action, ice, ice movement, and how it reacts and how our marina is, was originally designed with our dock systems. As you can imagine, dock systems over 27 years have improved. And there's many examples throughout the Great Lakes that have different types of dock systems that are in place year round on the Great Lakes that are able to withstand ice as well as wave action. So part of our proposal within the, in the capital improvements is initiate this professional marine consulting firm to start this process to at least evaluate where we're headed and come up with some options. Uh, come up with some options in terms of not only what type of infrastructure, but what does that infrastructure look like in terms of what's the most cost effective arrangement of docks and what size of docks. And we're working with our marine uh, operator, F3 Marine, looking at the industry. What, where, where's, the, where's the trend? Where are we headed? 
so that it's cost effective and that this, it's a good return on investment. The next building would be our municipal service building and our transit building. The service building is over 60 years old. Uh, it's roughly over about, about 115,000 square feet in size when you factor all the, the areas. Some of the issues are is when the building was originally built, <coughs> the vehicles were much smaller and not you know, multi, as much multifunction as they are today. And in some of the pictures, as you can see, this is the wash rack. It's very difficult for just a simple sign truck, not even a plow truck or a, a garbage truck. In fact, when we do our plow trucks, half the truck needs to stick out into the aisle to get access to it. And the building, you know, the lower pictures are just showing some of the, the, the foundation, the brick, the masonry work, and the siding as well. Many things with ADA as well within the building as we, we took, were addressed in that transition plan. Ultimately, we're looking to potentially look at combined with the service building is the transit facility, which is roughly 50 years old, and it's in dire need of some up upgrades. Again, the buses that were back 50 years ago weren't nearly as, as um, large and as needed as what they have today. So you can see some of the shop areas are very uh, congested. Storage is not very uh, conducive to the building. So there could be a combination when we're looking at joint facilities is how could we maybe combine the transit and the service building to save? If we're needing to invest large capital investment in one building, could there be an opportunity to co-locate? Co and maybe such as just even the service of the vehicles themselves, having a central service area where buses as well as the heavy duty trucks that DPW service, could that be just co-located, saving significant dollars instead of having two separate facilities? So that will be part of the study moving forward as well. Ultimately, these costs are, are projected out in the out years. Moving away from buildings now, we're, we're going into the other aspect of, of Mike Wilmes' area is street lighting and traffic control. And his team of two electricians and, and, and maintenance staff have been very, very busy over the years already upgrading our street lighting from high pressure sodium or the orange type of light that you see to now the LED. And it's saved significant energy throughout the city. These are just some examples of some of that work. In the program, you're seeing the costs that we do. We have some that are in, in citywide that we have a program, as well as an area that we've concentrated in the TIF district, which is in the main downtown area. So we're able to have some of those TIF proceeds and use that money to renovate and upgrade the downtown lighting. This is, for example, along Broughton Drive, we're looking eventually at replacing the old style concrete pole to to fit more with our marine uh, light fixture, the Lumic is the brand that we have standardized and, and carry that theme of lakefront lighting uh, in this area. I guess I'm, before I move away from buildings and traffic, are, or would there be any questions on any of these topics thus far for myself or Mike Wilmis that is in the, in the audience this evening? Questions so far? If, if not, oh, go ahead. Yes, and this is a very honest question. And it's not a rhetorical question. Um, I have moved to Sheboygan like less than about nine years ago, eight and a half years ago. And so I'm not familiar with the history behind the Arbor Center. Um, but when I look at it, I don't know this much activity. I mean, I, I, it's, if I, you know, if I have to uh, ponder about a, the type of expense expenditures that we are discussing for the Arbor Center, my first very simple question is: Do we need to do that? Do we need to spend this type of money for something that doesn't look? like providing much of a return to us? Is there a return I'm not aware of? Are there other, um, there have been, 
are there other uh, considerations about, or there have been other considerations about uh, what to do with the Harper Center, or we, I mean, what is the, the, the log, what are the logics behind it? The, the, the original premise uh, is, is that that area of the lakefront was, uh, back in the day, was not a very attractive area. There wasn't a lot of public access. It was just a boat landing and a parking lot. And the parking lot was not really improved even. Uh, it had a lot of mud, uh, gravel. So it, it wasn't a very desirable place for the community, given the type of asset that we have on our, on our, on our doorstep, in other words. So a lot of studies were done early in the 90s to jumpstart economic development. And one of the factors was leveraging our natural resource, the lakefront, with a marina, bringing in and beautifying that lakefront, making it a destination. And the studies showed early on in the process that there is what I would say a lot of direct and indirect economic benefit with the studies that showed that there is the direct spending of those boaters that are residing at the marina, but as well as those visitors that come to Sheboygan, recreate and, and also as transient boaters visit Sheboygan's marina. Now, uh, I'm going to help, you know, re revert to Chad a little bit, but I know with, with Visit Sheboygan and the Economic Development Corporation it, that in the past there's been quite a bit of studies. I, I can't cite them right now for you, but I'm sure as we move forward, a lot of that's going to be revisited in terms of, all right, if we invest this, what's the return on the investment? Is this a good investment? And does it have to be all City of Sheboygan money? I, I, I think there's an opportunity here that maybe with the right marine company in, in, in charge or working with us that a long-term lease and that they would be responsible for the capital improvements, taking that burden away from the city, but then they have a much longer term, what I would say exclusive right to manage that facility. Right now it's only a five-year contract. So every five years we, we ponder are we having a good contract with the marina or not? So do we want to go with a different operator? So there's not a lot of what I would say long-term uh, commitment. So that could be a possibility. But there are, there are studies, there are uh, cited returns on investment in terms of what the marina provides to Sheboygan. And again, I think that will be all come out during those studies. Director Palachek, additional comments? Yeah, just answering Dave's comments. So the uh, Visit Sheboygan has quantified that the waterfront equates to about eight and a half to 10 million of the visitor spending. So it is a it is a fairly significant amount of money and a lot of people that are traveling here from Chicagoland and Iowa are coming here because of the waterfront and the marina and the stuff that we have going on. So it, it is a fairly large piece of our economy, especially with the waterfront and then retailers and restaurants and all of that. So it's a it's a huge thing. It's a hard thing to put an actual dollar value on, but it's somewhere in the range of eight to 10, maybe as much as $12 million a year in visitor spending. Um, feel free to jump into just adding third commentary too. I believe last year, last summer was the best year on record in terms of operation, in terms of numbers of boat slips rented and transient boaters that stopped at the marina. So relatively speaking, last year was our best year ever. So, uh, Administrator Wolf, more comments. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I, what I would like to bring to the, to the committee's uh, attention is these uh, capital improvements projects typically are five years or a snapshot of what we're working on for next year and then the four years after that. This, uh, the marina has not been on any CIP since, correct me if I'm wrong, David, since the beginning. And that's kind of a failure on our part as a city because we knew that we had it. It is our gem. If you look at any of our marketing as a city, 
what do we market? We market the lakefront, we market our, you know, the lighthouse, the, you know, the videos of Sheboygan coming in are the sailing, uh, the, the marina is, is the focal point that really draws people to our community to stop, visit, and see our, our great shops and our, and our great parks and all of the other things. If we do not invest in this, what's our focal point? What do we provide um, visitors to, to really draw them here? So this is kind of a, I hate to say it, it's something that we should have been watching, we should have been looking at. We have had some significant uh, damage as Director Beeble had talked about, and we have been spending um, one, you know, $1.8 million in its lifespan. But I do want to point out that what we're doing moving forward is being more strategic. We're looking to look at the wave action that is affecting the actual peer system that we have. We're also looking at um, the different parts of it. We've had a lot of, you know, with the, the rise and fall of the water levels, we've had a lot of uh, additional uh, sand and silt in that build up in the actual marina, so it has to be dredged out. But we're looking at the opening of the mouth of the, of the marina to see, does that need to be adjusted to help protect the actual dock systems? We're also looking at docks that will be much more durable for the, for the life, lifespan of the marina. And I know that I wasn't around um, during the development of the marina, but I'm, I'm assuming that when we built it, I'm sure that we weren't looking, because we had no history, at spending the most money on the actual dock system itself. All of the dock systems that we have right now have chains underneath them to hold them in place. There are no spuds or columns that actually help hold the dock from movement, and they're all wood. So again, the technology of 27 years ago is a lot different than what we have uh, available today. So again, this is a, another good example of how we, the city, have assets just like David talked about the facilities and the age of the facilities that are coming of age, no pun intended, that need to be either remodeled or rebuilt or replaced because technology and processes have changed significantly. And this is what happens when you have uh, a city of 150 years old. Thank you. Other Prella, additional comments? Uh, no, thank you. Additional questions for DPW so far? All right, David, let's All get right. going. So we're gonna move into what I call our, our pavement management, our streets program. This evening, we, I have uh, Kevin Jump from our city engineering office, civil engineer project manager with our department that uh, was instrumental in putting many of these, these projects in front of you together. So the first one we're looking at is North 25th Street for next year. It's got a, a PACER rating of, of a four. The average annual uh, daily traffic is right, roughly between 4,000 to 5,000 vehicles a day. It's a concrete pavement. Originally built, some of it's been built in 1954 to 1974. So clearly it's, it's, it's met its, its life cycle and it's operated, in fact, in some cases beyond its life cycle. Uh, this section again is all concrete. So what we'd be looking at is some of these areas we would do some spot repairs, panel replacement, but ultimately it would be a asphalt resurfacing program. All the intersections would receive handicap accessible ramps. We would look at storm sewer upgrade at the intersections, catch basins, as well as look at the sanitary sewer in the area to see if it needs to be lined and uh, rehabilitated. Our next project is Broadway Avenue. This really is a sanitary sewer project, but because the sanitary sewer is so large, there's really, it becomes a road reconstruction because there's no road left after we reconstruct the sanitary sewer. So we have to pretty much remove the entire road to get at the sewer, replace the sewer, and then rebuild the road. So it's an expensive project, as you see, but there's an opportunity maybe to use some ARPA funds that we had uh, and ultimately not be of such a burden on, 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 the, on the capital improvements program from a, from a borrowing standpoint. 
But a very important project, the sewer is uh, built in the 30s. And again, it uh, is in dire need. The water utility actually a few years ago replaced the water main in this section already. So that, that does not have to be replaced. Lincoln Avenue is our next project. This project actually got advanced. It, uh, it was out actually, we planned it I think in 2025, but because of its condition, it, uh, it's not gonna last. So we, we really made uh, an effort internally. We did some internal engineering on this. It, it not only is the, the pavement bad, but there's hardly any curb and gutter left in this section. Again, it uh, was originally, the concrete was original in 1897. In 1926, it's been overlaid several times. And so we we're gonna remove this asphalt and look at the pavement underneath, do some spot repairs, and again, replace that curb and gutter and then provide much better uh, curb and gutter for drainage in the area and resurface this area. The next street project is South 11th Street. This is very similar to what we did uh, at, at South 10th Street last year. Basically, it's, it's from Indiana Avenue to Union Avenue. Uh, however, it may have to be shortened up to Broadway, be, depending on funding. Uh, we're finding that prices are becoming more and more expensive with where we're at and our normal length of streets that we are able to resurface or repair is becoming less with inflation and costs. So uh, as we have these pressures, we're not able to do as much because the money is not going, not being able to be used as far as we used to have in the past. So we're gonna keep you posted on, on South 11th Street. But again, this is a, you know, it's an old, old section of street Original concrete in 1923. It's got a PACER rating of 3.5. This is this is a this is an example where you know this is a section of the city that we you know it's a neighborhood section. It's not the highest traveled street, but it's an important street. And we, what we try to do is we we look at North 25th Street, which is a, a urban collector. Four to 5,000 vehicles a day, a lot of traffic that tra travel on it. A lot, a lot of people will see that impact of that street being resurfaced. But we also have to balance that by hitting our neighborhoods and getting some projects done so that the neighborhoods aren't neglected. Another project that we're looking at, and this is a continuation of a project that's gonna be starting next week on Calumet Drive, and 14th Street, uh, North, excuse me, Calumet Drive North is where we're gonna start our panel replacement. We did some last year on 14th Street from Erie Avenue to uh, roughly just a little bit north of, of Superior up to Saman Avenue, I would say. So what we did is we went into this section, it's four lanes wide, we blocked off one, one direction and we cut out squares of concrete that were cracked or starting to fail. The purpose of this is to extend the life of that section. That is one of our most heavily traveled sections in the city. And it's a great investment that those, these sections were, were paved in the 90s. And if we're able to get these panels replaced and maintained and keep them in good working order, that will further extend the life of, the, of, these, of these sections of pavement. This section actually is roughly from what's right between Evergreen Park and the Cory View Center. And that will happen in 2023. Now this is another streets project, but it's also a facilities and traffic because it deals with traffic. So Mike Wilmis and his department as well as the engineering department are involved in this. This is Taylor Drive in Wilgus Avenue intersection. The top photo shows the old types of traffic signal, some of the pavement condition. The bottom one is just an example. We're gonna upgrade the signal standards to the new monotube arms where you have the signal heads vertically over the lanes instead of just having one on a trombone arm. 
It's also going to be upgraded for handicap accessibility. There's now more, more, more pedestrians in this area. When this intersection was originally constructed, it was on the edge of the city. There wasn't much there except the IHOP. And people remember the IHOP there? Uh, okay. I'm, all right. Well, that's where the movie theater is. So there was no sidewalks out to the IHOP, or the movie theater, but there are now. And so we're getting more and more pedestrian pressure, so we have to have pedestrian signals. Right now, this intersection doesn't have the ped walk lights, so if you, you can't really get a, a signal to cross. Next is our sidewalk improvement program. This is a, just a map. Every year we try to hit a section of the city that we target for inspections. This year we're spending, this year, and actually in 2022, we were able to get some more funding. We're getting roughly 200,000. But in 2023, it's going back to the original scheduled value of 100,000 per year. Now we, we, do, we do our inspection area, our targeted area, as well as we do respond to complaints citywide. So if the department gets a complaint on a bad sidewalk and it's inspected and it's in bad shape, we will mark it for replacement. Next project is our stormwater management program. We've identified this, the pond at 29th and Geely. And I shouldn't call it a pond, it's really just uh, a, a very wet, uh, depression in the ground, for, for lack of a better term. This, this area was expanded uh, after the flood of 98. We did the, um, a pretty major upgrade. And what the next, this project would do is actually convert this to a kind of a dry pond to actually a full depth wet pond. So it, it's in its current condition, it's got a lot of invasive species. It's uh, got a lot of, a lot of opportunity. So the project will deepen the pond, clean it up, as well as do some other improvements. And uh, this is a very important project. This is a, a it's not only a, it's, its primary purpose today is flood control. After this project is also gonna have a water quality aspect because now with our, uh, our stormwater permitting with the DNR, we're responsible for not only controlling the water, but also cleaning the water before it gets discharged to either our lakes or our rivers. And this pond will also now be more of a water quality pond. We are looking at uh, securing some grants with that from the DNR as well. So before I move, leave the engineering streets and, and infrastructure, uh, I would ask if there's any questions on those projects. Questions on roads so far? Alder Perilla. I also brought along, just in case, I'll leave it up here. This is our complete plan map of the entire city showing all the stuff that we've completed since 2013, as well as which, what is planned year by year through year, 27, year 2027. And I will be able to forward this to all of you as, as a PDF document as well. Um, I just, it, it's a little easier. It, it wouldn't show up on the screen, but it's much uh, easier to see on, on a large board. Any follow up, Alder Uh Yes, I just was, I just want to offer a comment that I am, a little bit disappointed that to see in the CIP this year, just as last year, that sidewalks maintenance are getting $100,000 a year. Now the director, Director Bieber knows my opinion on this very well because I bring that up at the committee, at the Public Works Committee, almost on a regular basis. But I just want to emphasize that $100,000 a year basically repair or maintain, based on the data, 0.37 miles, linear miles, 0.37. So basically um, one third of a mile a year. 
just want to you know contemplate this this compared to what we do to maintain streets and what it means being more walkable we often um, praise ourselves as a walkable high degree of livability but our sidewalks and the attention we pay to sidewalks doesn't speak to that so it's just a comment um, and I hope that there will be some reconsideration. Director Beevil, any comments? I wholeheartedly agree. Sidewalks are, 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 are probably not funded uh, as well as a lot of all of the other projects. There, there's, there's, there's a need to balance the, the budget as well as what we're able to afford. Now, you're correct in terms of what we said about what, what it does in terms of the miles that sidewalk are replaced, but the sidewalks do last longer than streets because they do not take the pounding of traffic. Mm -hmm. So they, so in a sense, there is a little longer longevity in terms of lifespan of sidewalks that, that at least we've been able to see. Uh, but yet, you're right, I mean, it, it, on the grand scheme of things, when you look at 375 miles of sidewalks, you're right, I, 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 I can't argue the fact. It would be great to have more money to do more projects, but I, I, as you're seeing this evening and in the, in, in the proposal, uh, I think we're gonna find out at the end of the day, we're gonna probably have more needs than we're gonna be able to afford. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to at least make some tough decisions and be able to balance mm -hmm. and provide an overall good program that addresses all the areas. And I'm not saying just public works, we're looking at police and fire library, transit, all of the departments, they're all, everyone here has important functions that serve the community. So how do we, how do we as a, as a team and how do we come up with a plan that is fair to all those needs? Mm -hmm. And I guess, yeah, I, I, you make a great comment, uh, uh, um, Grazia, I, and I can't argue it, I'm not here to argue it and I'm not here to defend it, I'm just here to just to hopefully share more information about things. Thank you, Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, let's follow the money. Have you have you taken full advantage of the federal infrastructure bill, and is there more money there that we could manage? <laughs> we I, I would love to as soon as it becomes more and more available. It's right now. There's a lot of unknowns, and it's tied up so far at the Fed and state level. So we've chased a lot of the federal and state projects. We've we have some projects in the, and they're mainly for streets, but we're also looking at accessibility items as well. So there are some newer programs that are coming out with the infrastructure bill that will fund some of these, what, they're, what they would call, uh, they're not, let's say they're not their meat and potatoes road projects, so they have other funding mechanisms for discretionary projects such as pedestrian types of facilities. The problem with it is, is that a lot of the agencies aren't prepared to, di to distribute yep. this money, and their, their systems aren't really prepared yet. So as those programs get developed, we're gonna maximize our ability to chase that money and have projects ready on the books. We have plans already, in, in a lot of cases, and plans to submit to the DOT or other agencies that are, that are of sources of funding. I would encourage that wholeheartedly. Yep. <laughs> Additional questions so far? Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Dave, um, on a sidewalk basis, if you had, let's just wish list, how many sidewalks can you physically with your team repair? How much could you do if you had the money? Uh, with our team, very, very little. Uh, and, I, and I say that because we're con our team is concentrating on, on street repairs, storm sewers. We're, we do a lot of the crosswalks, the, the corners, and we'll do the handicap ramps, and quite frankly, that, that occupies all of our seasonal and, and full-time staff as we have in place. So all of the sidewalk work is, is a contract. We, mm -hmm. we contract it out, we'll go out for bid, and whatever their price is, we apply it to the, the, the contract or the budget, and then we actually assess that against the property owner. Mm -hmm. So we do get it back, but it's, it's, not, it's not a one-for-one one because they have, it's, it's delayed in terms of their payment, repayment. They have a five-year window to repay that, that sidewalk. 
Mm. So it's not a, so it's kind of always revolving in other words. And I, I would just say um, after years on this committee, it, it's been refreshing to see a plan uh, which we put in place some years back. The 100,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a lot more than we had before. Yeah. And it's the consistency of repair. And I've said for years, the city is judged a lot by the infrastructure, the Department of Public Works, the city, and the fire and police. And we're trying to address those as best we can. And I think we have a plan in place to do that. But when it comes to the streets, uh, and we're talking about cities that are high on lists of livability or likability for retirement and other things. Yeah, the sidewalks and streets are a high part of that. And I think we've come a long way to doing better in those areas. We've got a long way to go, but we just don't have the funds to do it all at once. But I think we have come a long way and we at least have a plan that we're well, following, I, which and, I appreciate. And I, I, I thank you very much for those words. I, I, and, and if you look at the, the, the display here, and as I said, I will forward this to everyone. It, it's, we have, as a department, have really concentrated and really stuck to the plan. And quite frankly, if you look at our pavement rating from where it was in, in 2009 to where we are today, it's, it's almost increased a full point. We are actually 5.9 was our overall average for the city. That's not a good average. We're almost at six and a half today. And I'm hoping that by this next cycle, we'll be closer to seven with our program that we've been routinely investing, investing. We had a year, we had several, several decades, no, I shouldn't say about a decade ago, we had, a, we had several years, about four years, where we had no projects at all mm -hmm. for street improvement. Well, we paid the price and it was fast and it showed real fast. So I, I yes, we know we have a tremendous amount of infrastructure, we have a tremendous amount of need and there's a tremendous cost to it. I think what we've tried to do is present a balanced approach. Thank you, Director Bebo. Additional questions so far? Otherwise, we'll keep proceeding. Oop, I had it up there. Next is our forestry, parks and forestry. Um, Tim Bull, city forester, is with us tonight, and, Tim, and, give Joel, a wave. And, and Joel Curlin, parks and forestry superintendent, and are here as well instrumental in the, the, the program. It, as you know, we've been talking about the effects of the emerald ash borer in our community. We've been tree city, the longest in the state, correct me, I'm gonna say 44 years. Did I get it right? Thank you. So 44 years, we're the longest running tree city in, in the state of Wisconsin, and now we're the first in the state of Wisconsin to be tree city in the world, uh, thanks to Tim Bull and Joe Curlin and the staff. This is a really awesome achievement. And I encourage you, if you ever watch Spectrum One News, there's a great news channel, uh, spot on them. What this map shows is really currently all the stumps that we have throughout <laughs> the city that need to be ground. So there's over 400 plus stumps. Oh, the, the blue dots represent the trees that are being treated for emerald ash borer that will be retreated. Uh, Tim and his uh, team, as well as Joe here, they, they were instrumental working with Roots and other, other partners to get our gravel bed for our tree replacement program. So we really concentrated on removal of the ash. We, I mean, the last four to five years, we were pounding it. We removed well over 1,000, probably close to 2,000 trees in the city, but now it's time to start replanting. We have a deficit, so we have to replant and so what we're doing is, with our capital plan, is really now concentrating on the replanting. And what you see is with the bare root trees, yeah, they're small, and they go in, but they really take off fast with this type of, with, with this type of structure that, that uh, Tim and his team and, and Joe and his team have worked together so hard at in terms of reforesting. Part of the problem is buying trees, especially larger trees right away, are very expensive. So what we're able to do is buy a lot of trees in their young state, get them in the gravel bed, jumpstart their root growth and really get them going and then give them a really healthy, good start within the community. So I wanna just pass that on. That's, that's a continuation of where we're going. The next portion is gonna be some of our parks project and what we have 
is our Optimus Park. We're looking to put a basketball court there. Uh, there isn't one today, and this is just like, it. this isn't what it's gonna be, but this is what you know, we, could, we could eventually have at that park. Very nice park, it has a mixed use neighborhood. Uh, there's some multifamily in the area, some single family in the area. There's a splash pad at the park now, and it's getting more and more use. The other project was, is at Cleveland Park, another very popular uh, neighborhood park. And what we were looking to do at this park is put a splash pad in. The, let me just back up. The, the, the shelter and the restroom actually has the water line and plumbing in place for, for this. We, it was stubbed in at the time with the future development of a splash pad when it was time. So this is what we're looking to put in is something similar, not this exact style, but a splash pad. And they're very popular in the summertime with the kids. That was real quick for 2023, the parks and forestry. Any questions before I move on to our wastewater treatment plant? Questions for parks and forestry? All right. All right. Good job, guys. All right, our wastewater treatment facility and sanitary sewer. I want to introduce Jordan Skiff here, our new superintendent, as well as Steve Josser, our existing superintendent that's going to be leaving us with retirement coming up in, in June here. So we have a great opportunity for the two of them to overlap and work with each other in this transition. It's one of our most critical assets in the city, a wastewater treatment plant. Again, 12 and a half million gallons of sewage is treated at this facility every single day. It's a very expensive operation. If we had to rebuild this plant from scratch, it's probably over a $200 million project. So that's why it's very important to invest and keep this facility running. So we're looking at our primary clarifier project. This is number one drive. What you see here is the drive being removed. This is a, from another clarifier, but this is what it looks like. Uh, they, they drain it. They take it, take the drive apart, refurbish it, do work actually on the structure on the bottom and in the inside and the concrete walls. They'll seal the joints, look at the mechanicals and then get things painted and get, get the corrosion fixed. They're gonna do two, they're gonna do a primary as well as a secondary clarifier. Next is our aeration upgrade. So this is where the basin is where we add air and oxygen. We diffuse bubbles into the, into the, into the, the uh, wastewater. Uh, this is looking at fixing and, and upgrading the diffusion and, and, and how we distribute the air within the system to get better coverage for the oxygen. Heat exchangers. I believe are, these are originals, so about 45 years old. Okay, thanks, Steve. Yeah, so these are original uh, heat exchangers. This is for our digesters. Yes, <laughs> got to read the fine print. So yeah, digester or heat exchanger. Uh, so we're going to remove these and replace them with new digesters that will have uh, improved flow as well as efficiencies. The big ticket item every year is our sewer lining program, roughly about a million dollars. What this does is, is it actually allows us to insert a liner within the existing pipe and not have to dig up the street to replace the sanitary sewer. It's a, a very successful program. I, I wanna say we've been doing it within the city for at least 30, 30 years now. And uh, it's been a real success. Uh, it, you're able to basically insert a new pipe in an old pipe without disruption to traffic or utilities or ripping up pavement. Uh, it's, it's been great, but it's not always the answer. So sometimes we do have to do reconstructs where, such as a Broadway, as I mentioned. And that 
that when you get to a reconstruct, it gets very expensive. So this, this program, although it's expensive at a million a year, it's saving a lot as well, and we're able to maintain and fix quite a bit of, of our sanitary sewers with this program. A lot of that is also in conjunction with our road projects. So when you see a road project, when you see this, when we're doing like a 25th Street or a, a, a South 11th Street, we also plan to line the sewer. We might have to go in and do a spot repair. We have to dig down maybe just a spot here and there. We'll fix it, but then we'll still insert the liner at a, at a, late, at a later time. Another successful program that is really part of, it, it's kind of odd, it's, it's mini storm sewer program. These are little smaller storm sewers that are put in backyards, and they're mainly to intercept yard drainage as well as sump pump drainage. So you say, why, why would wastewater fund this? Well, it's because without these types of systems, people will put the storm, they put their sump pump into their floor drain or put it down the sanitary and that adds a lot of clear water, a lot of extra water coming to be treated at the plant that needs to be pumped, treated, and, and it's expensive. We want to eliminate that clear water. So that's what this program's about. It's roughly around 50,000 a year. Not a lot of money because uh, these projects are difficult to get in backyards and, and install. So uh, we're, we average around b between two or three of these projects a year. Any questions about wastewater or sanitary sewer? Um, got a few. Uh, Alder Plicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, when you do a sewer reline, how many years does that give you? Well, we got 30 so far. I'm thinking we should at least get 50. We, years? We, yeah, and, 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 and it's it's basically it's basically a uh, um, almost like a plastic PVC, mm -hmm. but it's not that it's not that material. It's right. actually a fiberglass resin material. So it's a it's a plastic material that it it um, cures and, and gets hard in place. Therefore, um, it's it's very corrosive resistant. And uh, it also provides uh, better compressive strength from the clay pipe. So it, it's, the, the, the industry standard is roughly 50 years is what they're saying, but it's, uh, this technology we, you know, is probably only about 40 years old. So far, so good. I mean, it's been a, it's been a very successful uh, de deployment and application of it so far. Okay, thank you. Jerry? <laughs> Actually, Bert took that question, but I just also wanted to say thank you to Steve. I see he twisted your arm to try and stay a little while longer. Um, but Are you saving that joke, Jerry? No, I wasn't. <laughs> but it, his presentations over the years have been spot on, and it's one of the most expensive parts of the city that we have to upkeep, so thank you for everything you've done. Other questions? Keep going. All right. Last. We're getting to the end. Motor vehicles and equipment. Rick Nye, our supervisor of the motor vehicle division. This, this area really doesn't have as much equipment as it has in the past. And it's partly because we really made a concerted effort through the years with capital improvements to really invest and get us in a good place. The other aspect is, if you recall, we converted a lot of our, what I would say, light duty vehicle equipment to a lease program which is now becoming more operational expense instead of capital. That also will free us up moving forward. So it's a really successful program. And the timing, quite frankly, although it was a little hard with the supply chain at first, the resale on our vehicles that we're able to put back in the market have been um, fantastic. And that's been a real, above and beyond our earlier projections. So it's gonna be interesting to see where that ends up. So what we have, our one big, big purchase here for, for motor vehicle is our, our rear end, uh, basically, garbage truck, our garbage compactor. Uh, the, this is kind of the, the workhorse. We have two of these. Um, I got to get to the right page. <laughs> Maybe I'll just ask Rick. Rick, what's the age on this? 23 years old. Uh, and what, they, what, the, what they're primarily used at is our drop-off site and just for large rubbish. If you know now, we've gone to the cart system, so we're not able to pick up bulky items. When we have to go pick up bulky items, this is the type of vehicle that we'll, we'll deploy. 
Um, we don't deploy them on a regular basis. Again, one's primarily at the drop-off site all the time. The other one is used throughout the city as well as we do use them for leaf collection where the, we'll collect leaves and we'll put them in a big, big dust pan that gets attached to the back, dump the leaves in, and it gets the leaves get crushed and we're able to collect a lot more leaves with the packer. As well as we'll collect uh, Christmas trees in these vehicles. What we're proposing to do is, is not, we're actually gonna look at the used market. There actually is a used market for these types of uh, trucks. So we know since they're, they're kind of heavy duty and they're not really out and about on a daily basis, we can probably get by with a refurbished uh, truck since they're not on the road as much. So that would be our proposal. That's why uh, they're not as expensive as what a, a, a brand new garbage truck would replace. The other vehicle or the other piece of equipment that we're looking to buy is our chipper. So we have an older chipper. This is actually, we have one like this today. The other one is a little bit smaller. That is old and it needs to be replaced. This, we were gonna replace it with this model. And as you can see, it, it, it's not just chipping branches. These things can take up to about a 12 to 14 inch tree and run it right through it. Uh, it's a real time saver, especially when we're working with EAB and we were out there with the crew, fell a smaller tree and run it through the chipper and you're on to the next one instead of going through, chunking it up and, and, and getting it into the proper size so you can feed it. And our last piece of equipment is our zero tone turn mower. So again, three pieces of equipment, not too much, but uh, what we've really tried to do with our motor vehicle is, is smooth it right around 300 to up to 400,000 maximum a year. Some years are around 250. That, because the motor vehicle fund's an enterprise fund, in other words, this is not debt related, so the funds that we earn by charging ourselves rent internally for our vehicles goes in turn funds this replacement program so we're able to replace this on a cash basis moving forward. And, and that's why it's been reduced because by moving to the lease program, we're not re receiving as much rental income as we would in the past. All right. All right, thank you, Director People. Questions for Department of Public Works? All right, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, uh, Chad, city planning. And if you have time later and you want, don't have anything else going tonight, please stick around and look at the map. Yeah, right. You might. I look at the map and I tell David people, let's get this road a little further, a little more. So for city development, we have really just a couple projects related to the recent purchase of the Gartman Farm subdivision land. So about two weeks ago, the city closed on a $3.6 million project to purchase 195 acres south of Sheboygan on the corner of Menning and Stoll Road. Um, we will be pairing that property once we fully own it uh, which I'll talk about shortly, but we already own some land known as the Poth Farm on Stall Road, which is roughly around 85 acres. So we'll be pairing this one, the, the, these two together for about 210 acres of subdivision land, um, yet to be determined what that looks like. So we have a five-year payment plan with David Gartman. Um, we made our first payment this year when we closed of 900,000 for the next four years. We have $693,750 payments uh, to make to Mr. Gartman until we fully own it after year five. Um, what we're looking at doing is um, we're working with a number of consultants and or single family housing developers at this stage um, to look at laying out a master plan for the property um, moving forward for the next five to seven years, um, laying out subdivisions and other types of housing to kind of fill the affordable housing as well as um, other types of housing. It might be single family condominiums or um, those types of uses. So we 
so most of the time, let me back up. So most of the time we're, we would hope that we could attach this to a TIF district, a tax incremental financing district. We do not have that opportunity out there because the only TIF district we have that's close by is an industrial TID and industrial TIDs do not allow residential development. So we've budgeted some funding out of the affordable housing fund um, where we would set aside money for incentive payments to developers similar to what we would do to facilitate a development if it wasn't a TIF district. So if we're going to try to build, the goal here is to build more affordable housing, um, affordable single family. Uh, we don't have a lot of control over the construction costs, but we do have control over the land costs and the development costs. So we're hoping that um, some of this funding, as you can see for, there's a $2 million and a $1.5 million um, payment, those would go, and those wouldn't be just one lump sum, those would go to specific developers to defray the cost, to keep the cost of land more reasonable, so we can try to facilitate some more affordable type housing. So the, we have four years of payments, which would come from the affordable housing fund, and then we have uh, two years of, uh, budgeted over two years for incentive payments to help defray the costs of land development for these this development to keep the cost lower. What that looks like, we don't know yet. We just are in the early stages of this, but we know that in talking preliminarily with uh, single family housing developers around the state, it's gonna be a challenge keeping houses as a, at a reasonable price given today's con current construction costs. So if we can help by incentivizing to keep land costs Cost lower. Um, hopefully, we can keep the overall price of the house down. All right. Thank you, Director Pelchek. Questions for Director Pelchek? The other, sorry, the other project that there's a project on there for uh, 2027 that was added. It's Indiana Avenue gateway signage. So. Um, the master plan for Indiana Avenue had some type of signage that would announce the corridor as you entered it from Fort, off of 14th Street and onto Indiana. So I don't know if this is some kind of signage that would go over the uh, roadway similar to when you're driving into downtown Plymouth and it says Cheese Capital and it kind of spans the whole road. Um, but something of that sort, um, is, so we, bu we budgeted 250,000 for that out of the TIF district at the later end of the TIF timeframe once we're done with any other improvements. So that's why it's pushed out to 27. Alder flicky -Fineski. Um Talk to me about the trail projects, uh, Indiana phase two of three, three of three. So we have been negotiating for three plus years with the Union Pacific Railroad uh, to purchase the right of way of the old railroad from Pennsylvania Avenue down to Mead Avenue. Um, we, have a di we had a difference of opinion for a number of years. The railroad thought that we owed them 1.2 million where we would have to buy all of our uh, right of way back and our number was 875, which doesn't include the right of way. Um, we have since, we continue to negotiate and the city attorney's office is negotiating as we speak to try to get that number um, somewhere in between there, but we may have to just move forward at the 1.2 million for acquisition. Um, so the plan is to use um, TIF 17 and TIF 20 dollars to uh, fund the acquisition and then apply for some recreational trails grant funds from the DNR to help offset the construction costs. In the discussions that we've had with the DNR, they said it would be a lot easier if we could purchase the uh, right away without bringing them into it because of their federal requirements, but they would be willing to participate in some stage of the construction. So uh, we're hoping that we can get to an agreeable number and that we can advance that purchase and then ultimately plan and construct the extension of that trail. Thank you. More questions? Alder Prella? Yes, about that project that is beautiful. Um, so the 2.5 million would include the 1.2 plus some of the construction. So what is the, the 
Please. Yeah, the, 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 the purchase price would be 1.2 million and the estimated construction cost from 2020, which is probably elevated now, but that was about two and a half million to build it. So what does this 2.5 million include again? The one, the 2.5, the two. No, it's 3.7 total. So it's 1.2 million to buy the right away from the Union Pacific Railroad, and then another two and a half million to construct the trail. It's a fairly long Pennsylvania to Mead, and then down Indiana Avenue is got to be two, three miles, I would say, if not more. Right up to Oscar. What? Up to Oscar. Actually, it's through Union to the south, so almost to the McDonald's on South Business Drive is where it would terminate. Thank you. Last call for questions for development and planning. All right, thank you. Thank you. Final call, anyone else wanna go? All right, just checking. All right, well that concludes our presentation today. Um, so the RO will hold over until May 3rd. Um, just want to, you know, if, if just for the commissioners, uh, please review, go over your books, take notes. If you have questions in the meantime, please reach out to the respective departments as well. Um, otherwise, we'll have final del deliberations and we'll make a recommendation to council on May 3rd, which is next week. We've exhausted the agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. There's been a motion by Roberta, second by Jerry. All those in favor of adjourning, please state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We are adjourned at 831.